evening, friends and family. Happy Sabbath. Welcome back to the Science of Time series. I'm your servant, Brother Paul Punch of Clear Distinction Ministries. And beloved, it has been quite some time since we've sat down and studied together. Exactly one month and some change, I believe, by the grace of God. As you can see, we, uh, we've had to do a little bit of a change up of our scenery for the remainder of the series because by the grace of God, beloved, our previous location of shooting has become a baby's nursery. Yes, beloved, on August 17th, by the grace of God, yours truly became a father to a beautiful baby boy, myself and my lovely wife. His name is Zion, and we pray that you will continue to pray for us as we grow in the knowledge of God to finish the work in this final generation. Beloved, my heart is overjoyed. I, I don't know if you can tell already by the smile on my face, but my heart is overjoyed, and I'm very thankful uh, to be able to share that with you. During this time that I have had a, a bit of a hiatus off of YouTube, beloved, I've had time to think. And I've been praying about the shortness of time and the, the, the necessity of God's people understanding what must be done in connection with the shortness of that time. Many of you have been reaching out via email and you've been letting us know how, how encouraging these studies have been for you. You have been letting us know the, the various revelations that God has been giving you, encouraging your heart, letting you know the shortness of time, and yet encouraging your hearts with peace rather than anxiety, knowing that so long as your minds are fixated on Jesus and Jesus alone, faithful is he that began the work, beloved, and he will finish it in you. We're thankful for your emails. We're thankful for your support, beloved. And we want to pick up today from precisely where we left off. You see, some of you may have thought that the series was over. No, beloved, that was only halftime by the grace of God. We are going to finish this thing by the grace of God, and we are going to understand not only the shortness of time, but the great work that God is going to accomplish in our homes. What do you say? I thank God for the opportunity to share this word with you. Now, beloved, I told you that during this time that I've been off of YouTube for a little while, I have been thinking, and I was praying to the Lord, and I asked him, I said, Lord, there are so many ministers at this time who are speaking on the shortness of time. We're all aware that time is short. Amen? There are many ministers who are speaking on this uh, very topic right now, and I'm praying about it. I said, Lord, what exactly do you desire for your people to grasp here at Clear Distinction Ministries concerning the shortness of time? What is it exactly that we're seeking to get your people to understand? Now, we already know, by the grace of God, that on this channel... We are constantly seeking to inspire in our viewers a timely thirst after the man Christ, our righteousness. Amen. And if you don't know that by now, beloved, there, there are more than 80 videos on this channel for you to sift through and you will not cease to hear the name of the man Christ Jesus. You will not cease to be pointed to the most holy place, which started October 22nd, 1844, and the ministration of that man at this time for the salvation of his people. Beloved, that is all we do here at Clear Distinction Ministries by the grace of God. But I'm saying, Lord, what exactly do you want your people to grasp right now from this series? Beloved, I did a message earlier on in the series called Understanding the Behavior of Time. And I want you, by the grace of God, I believe the Lord wants you as well, to understand thoroughly the concept the principle that was laid out in that video for our viewers. Beloved, we need to understand the behavior of time because you see there are many who will speak about time and not understanding the behavior of time will give you a wrong understanding of what needs to be done right now. There are many who will speak on the shortness of time who have no understanding of the behavior of time. And beloved, we need both an understanding of the shortness of time and a thorough knowledge of the behavior of time in order for God to accomplish with this body what must be accomplished in this final generation. During that study, beloved, I showed you a few things. I want to uh, just briefly recap uh, some of those points with you even now. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 8. I'm already there in my Bible. Matthew 24 and verse 8, we covered speaking about the various signs of the time. Very famous chapter, Matthew 24. And one thing I want us to see right now is that in verse 8, the Bible said, concerning the nations warring against nations, concerning the wars and rumors of wars, concerning the various antichrists and deception, etc., etc., the Bible says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. 
What does the Bible say, beloved? It says all those signs, all those indicative signs, all those alarms, wake up call signs are the beginning of sorrows. Now, if you've studied this text specifically, beloved, speaking of the beginning of sorrows, you know by now that Jesus was speaking in the context of birth pains, labor pains. And we know, beloved, that the closer the mother gets to delivery, you see, I'm speaking from experience now, praise the Lord, because I saw that thing. Let me tell you something. God is amazing. The closer that you get to the birth, beloved, the more intense the more frequent the labor pains, the contractions. Isn't that right? The more frequent and the more intense the contractions they become as you're getting closer and closer to the birth. So the very fact that Matthew 24, in these particular signs, Jesus put it in the context of labor pains tells us something, beloved. The more intense, the more frequent we see these signs. And are they intense today? Yes, they are. Are they more frequent in this generation than any generation before? Yes, they are. We've covered this, beloved. Then something or someone somewhere on God's green earth is getting ready to be born, dare I say, born again in time for the second coming of Jesus. Beloved, all of creation right now, the Bible says, is waiting for the manifestation, I'm going to use another word, the birth of the Son's of God. All of creation. In fact, let me show you the text. I want you to see this from your Bible for yourself. I love sharing the word with you, beloved. I love it even more when you can read it for yourself. Romans chapter 8. We're turning in our Bible to the book of Romans, the eighth chapter, and we're going to be reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 18, the Bible says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What is the Apostle Paul speaking of, beloved? He says that the suffering that we have gone through, this side of the great controversy, are not worthy to be compared with the glory, with the character that is to be revealed where? In us. Follow the thought. Verse 19. For the earnest expectation, notice the Bible does not merely say the expectation. This is something that is earnestly being waited for, beloved. Somebody is earnestly waiting. Did not we see that Christ is waiting with longing desire? Beloved, that is earnest expectation for the manifestation of himself where? In his church. The Bible says, for the earnest expectation of the creature, meaning all of creation is expecting this, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What is all of creation waiting for in 2023? The manifestation or the birth of the sons of God. What is the father? waiting for in heaven right now before he sends his son to come and get his children. He's waiting for them to, first of all, be born the manifestation of the sons of God. There are many of us today, beloved, who claim to be born again. And the reality, beloved, is that if we were born again, the great controversy would have long concluded by now because all of creation is waiting for the manifestation or the birth of the sons of God in whom, according to verse 18, the glory of God is revealed. Further evidence, 1 John chapter 3. Turn with me to the book of 1 John chapter 3. Why are we going through this, beloved? Because I don't want us to go through a series such as this. To go through a series such as this, beloved, and leave with nothing more than the fact that time is short. Beloved, I did not have to do this series to tell you that. You can turn on the news, CNN, Fox News, ABC, or whatever other news networks there are out there. You can turn on the news and read any news article to get that message. That is not the purpose of this series. The purpose of this series, beloved, is not merely to show you the shortness of time, but to help you understand the behavior of time so that by the grace of God, we can be on board with the Lord's plan at this time. Beloved, the work can be finished 
in our generation. Yea, the work shall be finished in our generation. But in order for that to be accomplished, beloved, somebody has to wake up to the behavior of time. Somebody has to understand that it is not enough to tell you that time is short. You've got to see that it is literally within your power by the grace of God through cooperation with our faithful high priest to wrap up this great controversy to end COVID-19. There I said it, beloved to end the racisms and the wars and the rumors of wars, to put away all of these things by allowing Jesus's character to be manifested in his church at this time. I want you to see this. What exactly do the sons of God look like? First John chapter three, beginning at verse nine, the Bible says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Do you see that? So this issue a victory over sin, beloved, is critical to be understood at this time. It is impossible as a Christian. It is impossible as a Protestant. It is impossible as a Seventh-day Adventist to believe that you are born of God. Okay? And to with the same mouth declare that it is an impossibility to keep the commandments of God. It is an impossibility to have victory over sin. Beloved, we sing the song, would you be free from the burden of sin? Is there power in the blood or not in 2023? God is waiting for a body that understand the potency of that blood and not only understand the potency of that blood, but demonstrate through their life, beloved, that that blood never loses its power, that it is just as strong in 2023 to keep a man from falling as it was back in the year 31 AD to get Peter and to help him to repent from denying Christ. It is just as powerful in the year 2023 to keep a family from falling as it was in the days of the Apostle Paul when it turned Saul around on that road to Damascus. God has power to free us today. The question is, do our lives testify that that is so? My Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Beloved, it is time for our lives to stop lying on God. It is time for our lives to become living epistles, read of all men. This is the behavior of time. Until that is so, we will remain in this wilderness of sin and sickness and suffering and death until God finally has a body that is prepared to enter the heavenly Canaan. Beloved, not a, not a, not a stain of sin will enter there. We understand this. We saw that in Revelation 22 verses 15 and 16, we saw that the only people that have a right to that tree of life are those who keep his commandments. How do we get there, beloved? How do we get to this experience of victory over sin? Looking again at what the sons of God look like, verse nine, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Why? For his seed, that is Christ, remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, beloved, impossible, because he is born of God. The Bible says that if you don't believe in victory over sin, you don't believe in being born of God. Because if you were born of God, you could not. It would be impossible to commit sin because Christ, the seed of the woman, promised in Genesis 3.15, promised in Galatians 3.16, that Savior, that high priest would keep you from falling, Jude verse 24 if you were actually born of God. Beloved, I want you to see in verse 10 where the Bible says, in this, in what, beloved? In this victorious fact, in this victorious relation between the seed and his people, Christ's ability to keep us from falling in that he abides in us, in this fact, beloved, the children of God are what? Manifest. And the children of the devil as well. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. God is seeking to manifest his character of love in you and I at this time. All of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Who are they? They are they who have Christ, the seed abiding in them, and he has given them the victory over every sin, cultivated, hereditary, whatever. It does not matter what the sin is. There's power enough in the high priest today to give us the victory. This is why the Bible says we are more than conquerors. And we're gonna understand a little bit more about that, beloved, because I want you to see 
When it comes to God's plan of redemption, if the only thing you can see is your need of conquering, then you don't understand the plan yet, as you should. We are more than conquerors, meaning God has something for us that is more than just victory over sin. Do you see that? God has more for us with that than that, but the fact of the matter is as a denomination, for generations now, we have been fighting over whether or not the experience is even actually possible. The Bible says, beloved, let God be true and every man a liar. I want us to understand that the behavior of time is the, the cardinal point of our series. The behavior of time is the cardinal point of this series. If you miss everything else, beloved, please understand that Jesus Christ cannot and will not return. Time will never be cut short in righteousness except God has a body that is both willing and cooperative with Jesus in the most holy place, surrendering all sin, all iniquity, all transgression, according to Leviticus chapter 16, so that Jesus can take those sins and put them on the head of Satan, the scapegoat. We are talking about the anti-typical day of atonement. Now, beloved, for some of you, it may feel as though I'm throwing around a bunch of code words. Leviticus 16, the day of atonement, all these various things. Beloved, that's why we're here by the grace of God to study these things out and better understand there are many things that I would love to share with you right now. But the reality of the matter is, beloved, except this foundation be laid thoroughly, it would be dangerous to build upon it. You see, a man who knows nothing about the Lamb of God can't understand that there is a Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. A man that doesn't understand the significance of a dying Lamb can never appreciate the reality of a living priest. We have to go step by step in order to become more than conquerors just in time for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We see here in our Bible, beloved, that in this, the children of God are manifest. Now, thinking about the, the coming of Jesus in the context of a birth, Jesus Christ will come back to receive his children once they are born. Once there is a people that look like this, he's coming back. That's what Christ's object lesson says. That's what the Bible says. That, that's fact. Now, thinking about it in that context, Beloved, I showed you a quotation from Inspiration where the prophet told us that as of March 30th, 1903, we were supposed to be in the heavenly Canaan already. That means within that first generation of Adventism, the work could have been wrapped up. In fact, I showed you from the book of Psalms that David looked forward to a generation to come, a generation that would be created while Jesus was in the sanctuary above. And that generation, beloved, is the final generation. The final generation was supposed to be, uh, uh, its work rather, was supposed to be accomplished and could have been accomplished even from the days of the prophet, Sister Ellen G. White. But I showed you throughout the history of this denomination, beloved, that there was a gradual slippage, a falling into a lukewarm condition, and we lost the experience necessary to finish the work. In this generation, God is seeking to restore it. Okay, God wants to bring us back and God wants to make us even better than we were before. God wants to bring us even further because you see light does not regress. The path of the just shineth more and more, brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Light does not regress. Okay, we are not expected to have a lesser understanding of the character of God in this generation than the generations before. We are expected to have a greater understanding of the character of God, of the righteousness of Christ in this final generation. So much so that the entire earth will be illuminated with that glory. All right. Now, beloved, I believe that rather than God's ministers at this time, are uh, fighting about whether or not we can know how short time is or whether or not we, we, we should know this is the final generation with statements such as the one I just described, March 30th, 1903, we could have been in the heavenly Canaan. Beloved, that tells me we're living on borrowed time. No Adventist under the sound of my voice should have any scruples with the thought that we are the final generation. We should have been in the heavenly Canaan. This work should have been completed. If not you, beloved, then who? If not now, then when? You see, when I look at this, by the grace of God, in the context of labor pains, in the context of a birth, and that's what heaven is waiting for, the birth of the children of God, I realize that we are well beyond being full term. Full term, 
for the manifestation of the sons of God was 1844 forward. And we've been here, beloved, for over 178 years since that day. We are well beyond full term. So why hasn't the birth transpired yet, beloved? Why hasn't Christ been able to come back yet? It's because we who are to be manifesting the character of God in our characters, we who are to look like Jesus, beloved, are holding up the entire plan. Now, I say we, beloved, because I don't want you to think that I'm talking about you. This is a family matter. Amen? It, it involves me. It involves my wife. It involves my little son. By the grace of God, we have been holding up this thing. And by the grace of God, beloved, I believe that it is time for a divine inducement of this birth. What do I mean by that? Somebody says, well, you, you, you can't induce the people of God. You can't, you can't make it happen. But, beloved, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Did not Peter say in 2 Peter chapter 3, did not Peter say that we were to look for and to hasten the second coming of Jesus? Now, if the coming of Jesus is dependent on this manifestation of the sons of God and we're hastening it, beloved, is that not a divine inducement of the birth? Is it not? When, when God says, I will cut the work short in righteousness, is that not us working with God to induce the birth uh, at this time. Beloved, we are living in a time where God needs ministers who are willing to apply the message that brings the people out. Willing to apply the message, rather, that brings the character of God out among his people. We need that message of the righteousness of Christ to go forth in every church that calls itself Seventh-day Adventist at this time. That is what we should be doing, beloved. That is what we need to be doing by the grace of God. And so as we continue in this series, I want you to know, beloved, that that is precisely what I intend to do. And I will do nothing else until the manifestation of the sons of God is a reality in this generation. Until it is a reality, beloved, we will continue to do what we're doing here. I believe that as Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah and as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. I believe that we can be of one or two groups. There are those of us, beloved, who are going to wait to the very last minute to do exactly what we're talking about right now. We're going to wait to the very last minute and we could lose our entire family and only be saved by the skin of our teeth. Lot. Or, by the grace of God, we can be proven faithful and our entire family be saved even if the entire world rejects what we say. Beloved, I'm thankful for the godly example of Noah in such a time as this. Because, beloved, I don't care that we've never seen a raindrop before. I don't care that we've never seen a Sunday law before uh, pass in the United States in the way that we're talking about it coming. The fact of the matter is that God's word never fails. It never returns unto him void. And if we believe that we are that generation, then it is time to cooperate with Jesus in a way that we've never done before. What do you say? And so today's message, beloved, is entitled, Understanding the Message of of this final generation. During our last study, we took a look at the work of this generation being that of restoration, amen? And we're gonna piggyback off of that thought even now and build upon it from the Word of God. We wanna begin by reviewing the relationship that exists between great work and little time. In the book Early Writings on page 64, we were told, in a view given on June 27th, 1850, my accompanying angel said, Time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointed to the earth and saw that there would have to be a getting ready among those who have of late embraced the third angel's message. Said the angel, get ready, get ready, get ready ye will have to die a greater death to the world than ye have ever yet died. I saw that there was, number one, a great work to do for them, and number two, but little time in which to do it. Then I saw that the seven last plagues were soon to be poured out. Pause there. Great work. Little time. Great work to be done for them, implying we have a helper in the sanctuary above. Amen. And little time in which he must accomplish that work in us. Little time in which we must cooperate with him to get that work finished. Do you see the point? 
Now she said, then she saw that the seven last plagues were soon to be what? Poured out. This, of course, beloved, is in reference to the standing up of Michael found in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, where the Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the prince, the great prince that standeth for the children of thy people, and there would be a time of trouble such as never was. Beloved, we're talking about the general close of probation in regard to this statement right here. So there's great work and there's little time before the close of probation and the standing up of Jesus to return and receive a people. Do you see that? Great work, little time. That great work, beloved, is that we must reflect the lovely image or the character of Jesus fully. Now, the reality is we don't look that way right now, do we? But God is so merciful in that probation has not yet closed, there is time enough even now to become a close, intimate, personal friend of God in time for the crisis, beloved. We saw in our previous studies, beloved, that time responds to the harvest readiness of God's church. Did we not? Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 12. Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 12, proving this fact from our Bibles. The Bible says, concluding the third angel's message and work, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Notice that the third angel concludes his work with the production of a people that keep the commandments of God. They have victory over sin and they have the faith of Jesus. So how did they do it? They were justified by the faith of Christ. Do you see that? Following on, beloved, in verse 14, what happens as a result of the third angel's message producing this body? And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto who? The Son of Man. Beloved, who is the Son of Man? This is Jesus. It says he had on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and do what? Reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Notice, beloved, that the time for Christ to return, the second coming of Jesus, for the reaping of the gospel harvest was made possible by the ripening of that harvest. The moment there was a ripened body, the moment there was a people that had victory over sin, the righteousness of Christ, the moment there were a people that emulated the character of God as it is in Jesus, time came for the second coming of Jesus. Do you see it in the Bible? This is the behavior of time. Time responds to the harvest readiness of God's church. We can either hasten or delay the coming of Jesus, beloved. But let me tell you something. We can't stop it. If we refuse to be on board with God's harvest readying message, the message of justification by faith and the character of God that springs from looking at Jesus, if we are not willing to be on board with that message and that work, the reality is, beloved, we will cease in our advancement in spiritual things. But God will still have a body on time for the second coming of Jesus. I prefer to be on the Lord's side. What do you say? Now that generation, beloved, that is harvest ready are obviously the limit generation. They are what limit the time. They are what cut the work short in righteousness in cooperation with God. But we saw in our earlier studies that God declared that limit generation from the very beginning of the creation of this world. And we saw in creation week that God created all things in six days and he rested on the seventh day from his work. Beloved, we know that this was all typical of the final generation, that generation that David said would be created once the work of the sanctuary was going on. We saw that in Psalms 102 verses 18 and 19. We will come back to that text. Now, in six days, God created the heaven and the earth. And on day six, beloved, just before the seventh day on the Sabbath, God created man. He created the human family. And we saw that likewise, in God's great week of time, 7,000 years, 6,000 on earth, 
1,000 in heaven, according to Revelation chapter 20, we saw that in the 6,000th year, God would restore humanity and the restored human family would finally make its debut just in time for the second coming of Jesus. Now, true, we do not have a definite year, a definite day or month for when we will reach the 6,000th year. But based on our study of the plan of redemption, beloved, we saw that God has left just enough information, just enough evidence for us to see we are the generation that the 6,000th year will reach, uh, will be reached. We are that generation, beloved. And we studied how our pioneers, our earlier pioneers, J. N. Andrews, Sister White, James White, uh, uh, various hymnal writers of the SDA church, they were all in agreement that the 6,000th year is associated with the second coming of Jesus. The 6,000th year is associated with the general close of human probation and the standing up of Jesus, the seven last plagues. The 6,000th year, beloved, the very year that points to this generation is what makes this generation the final generation in the sense that the limit will be reached. But beloved, I want us to understand, now that we understand the behavior of time, I want us to understand that the only thing that makes this generation the generation in which Jesus will come is that Jesus will finally get a hold of the heart of a people who love the appearing of their Lord. Christ could have come back all of this time and he's yet to return, beloved, because we've put worldly enterprises before his work. We've put worldly ambitions before his work. God says, I will have a body. Ministers, lay people, if I don't have any Seventh-day Adventists, beloved, I will let the stones cry out, but I will have a body that love the appearing of their Lord and that will cooperate with him just in time to bring Jesus out of the most holy place. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Now in the book Education, we were told the central theme of the Bible the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters is the redemption plan, the restoration. What are those words, beloved? The restoration. The plan of redemption is a restoration plan. Please catch what I am telling you right now, beloved. Whenever we're talking about the plan of redemption and the time of redemption. We are talking about the plan of restoration and the time in which it took restoration to take place. Are we catching what I'm saying? God's plan of redemption, the great work, the little time in which it must be done is restoration and the time in which it takes restoration to take place. That is what we're talking about. The redemption plan, the restoration in the human soul of the image of God. The burden of every book and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme. What theme is that, beloved? The redemption plan, the restoration plan of God. He who grasps this thought has before him an infinite field for study. He has the key that will unlock to him the whole treasure house of God's word. He has the what, beloved? The key. What is the key to unlock the entire treasure house of God's word? It is the redemption plan of God. It is the restoration plan of God. Amen. And the understanding that the entire Bible is given for the purpose of unfolding that wondrous theme. If we are to understand the final generation, the work of the final generation, the message of the final generation, we have to realize, beloved, the connection between all those things and restoration taking place at a specific time. Do, do we see what I'm saying? Do we see what I'm saying? Now, beloved, I want us to understand that while God created in six days, he did rest on the seventh. In the same way, at the end of 6,000 years, Jesus returns for a Sabbath millennium with his saints. Now, I want you to see something interesting. Acts chapter 3. What does the Bible call that time when Jesus returns? The second coming of Jesus was called something specific by, I believe it was Peter, in the book of Acts chapter 3. Turn there with me. Acts chapter 3. Beginning at verse 19, the Bible says, Repent ye therefore, and be what? Converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Is that most holy place language? Yes, it is that your sins may be blotted out 
when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When is Jesus going to blot out the sins of his people? When the times of refreshing shall come. Beloved, I believe we're living in such a time. We are living in such a time. In verse 20, the Bible says, And he shall send who? Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Verse 21 is very key. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Notice, beloved, that Peter said that Jesus, who would blot out our sins in the times of refreshing, Jesus, who the Father would send to get his church, would be received into heaven and kept in his work in heaven until a specific time. That time, according to Peter, is the time of the restitution of all things. Now that word restitution, do you know that it is applicable to say the word restoration in its place? The word restitution and restoration are the exact same thing. Jesus, according to Peter, would be received into heaven and would stay in heaven doing this work of blotting out sin until the time of restoration. Now, beloved, I, I pray that you're catching what I'm saying. If you have been following the series, especially the last study, very closely, then you understand what is being said here. What we are saying, beloved, is again, this is the generation in which Christ will come. We do not have a day. We do not have an hour. We do not have a definite time to give. But we know enough based on the evidences that have been provided thus far throughout this series, beloved, that we are it. How long, the angel asks in Daniel chapter 8, how long shall this uh, state of things continue for the papacy to, to, to throw the sanctuary underfoot and to trod the people of God? How long unto 2,000? And 300 days, he said unto me, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Then shall the sanctuary be vindicated. Then shall the sanctuary be restored. Beloved, is the direct implication of the text. We are living in a time of restoration. But we are in a more specific sense, beloved, living in the generation now of restoration. The generation of restoration. And when we're speaking about it in the context of the Advent movement, beloved, it's very, very prophetic. The reason being... The Advent movement and its message were brought into existence to bring Jesus back. But Christ, according to the Bible, would not return in just any generation. He would return at the time of the restitution or the restoration of all things. Are we not that generation, beloved? Did we not prove that during our last study? If you don't remember, we're about to talk about it again, beloved. The final generation's work is that of restoration. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 51. Psalm, the 51st chapter, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 and 13. The Bible says, restore unto me the joy of salvation. Do what, beloved? Restore and uphold me with thy free spirit, or in other words, keep me from falling. Verse 13 says, then, meaning after God has restored us, after God has held us up and kept us from falling, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Why are we not able yet to give the loud cry? There is restoration. There is an upholding that must happen within our hearts, beloved. And when that happens, the Bible says, then and not a moment before, will we be able to teach transgressors the way of God, and sinners shall be converted unto him. During our last studies, beloved, we saw that from generations one through four of this movement, many things have been going on. In the first generation, God gave us the sanctuary truth, October 22nd, 1844, in which he restored our understanding of the law of God, the spirit of prophecy, the Sabbath truth, the health message, and various other foundational doctrines of this movement. Beloved, without those foundational pillars, the movement falls away. You see, Satan understands this. The Bible says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And so Satan has sought to destroy the foundations of our faith. 
we saw, beloved, that in that first generation, there existed such a condition of brotherly love, such a condition of willingness to surrender all for the second coming of Jesus. People were selling their houses and their farms and giving up everything because they loved the appearing of their Lord. It, it was such a heavy uh, experience that the angel was able to say that with that generation at a specific content, uh, conference in 1856, with that generation, God would return for a body. The seven last plagues would have taken place. Some would have died. Some would have received the mark of the beast in that generation. But beloved, by the following year, we had slipped into a lukewarm, legalistic condition. And from the 1850s forward, that is the condition that the church has been struggling against. In 1863, we were organized officially as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but Seventh-day Adventism as an organized body has always struggled with that lukewarm condition that crept into this movement from the 1850s onward. Now, in the year 1888, in the second generation, God sent a most precious message to his people through elders A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. This message was designed to present the uplifted Savior and to help us to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Victory over sin, literally an experience right there for us in 1888. But what happened, beloved? Did we receive the message and thus wrap up the work, bringing in Christ our righteousness? No, we did not, beloved. The fact that we're having this study in 2023 is evidence that we did not. But we went through many evidences before. The message was resisted, it was rejected, beloved, and because of that, a deterioration in the spiritual condition of God's church only worsened as time went forward. In the third generation from 1924 to 1964, we saw Heppenstahl's work, beloved, and from the 1930s to the 1950s, the final generation, as taught by men such as M. L. Andreasen, Sister White, James White, and all our other pioneers, the final generation was rejected. The nature of Christ was rejected. Victory over sin and the investigative judgment were all opposed by the work of Heppenstall. By the fourth generation, beloved, it did not get any better, but it only got worse. And that man by the name of Desmond Ford from the 1970s forward was responsible for the investigative judgment, the sanctuary, and our other key doctrines being opposed by men who stand in our pulpits calling themselves Seventh-day Adventists. Beloved, there's a civil war going on. And the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So I want us to understand, it's not the men that we're at war with. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But beloved, those heresies and doctrinal uh, changes that have come into the church to lessen her power and her effectiveness in the finishing of the work, those things we ought to meet by the grace of God with the truth as it is in Jesus. And we saw, beloved, that continuing on through the first, second, third, and fourth generation, there was a principle in Exodus 34 that was to be applied to this movement. The Bible said, speaking of God's character, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto when? the third and to the fourth generation. And so we saw, beloved, that in the third and fourth generation, the iniquity of the pioneers of this movement, which led to the rejection of that most precious message of justification by faith in 1888, has led to the deterioration, the degradation, yea, even the dying of this body. Now, somebody says that might be a little, uh, a little much how can you say that we have died as a body? Does not inspiration say that our greatest need right now is a revival and reformation? Revival or to be brought back to life implies that somebody has died. And that is exactly what has happened, beloved, as we have let go of Christ bit by bit by bit. And so failure to appreciate those gifts, those truths that were given in the first generation of this movement, produced a woeful harvest, beloved, unto the third and fourth generation. But we are not living in the fourth generation anymore, are we? As of 2004, we are no longer living in the fourth generation. In this movement, beloved, in its sequence, you could call us the fifth generation in that we are the generation that comes after the fourth. But we saw from the Bible that the Bible does not call us the fifth generation. It calls us something else. In the book Evangelism, before we come to that point, we were told that we may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years 
as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, beloved, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequences of their own wrong course of action. We ask the question, what does the Bible say about this generation? Who are we? Does the Bible call us the fifth generation? No, beloved, but does it make sense to call us that in that in numerical sequence, we are the generation after the fourth? Yes, it makes sense. But biblically speaking, what does the Bible call us? We saw, beloved, that the iniquity had ripened, resulting in spiritual degradation and judgment upon the third and fourth generation of this movement. One cycle of sowing and reaping is four generations, therefore, or a total of 160 years. The Bible called the first generation the palmer worm generation. The Bible called the second generation the locust, the third the canker worm, and the fourth the caterpillar. And when we looked at Joel, beloved, and we looked at the margin, we saw that all of these creepy crawly things that are used to describe the first four generations of the movement are entirely locusts. They are what? Locusts. So the palmer worm is called the chewing locust. The locust of the second generation is called the swarming locust. And you notice that the behavior of the locust changes as the generation changes. The third generation was called the crawling locust. And the fourth generation is called the consuming locust. Meaning, beloved, if it's not for what God is about to do next with this generation, everything he gave us in the first would be entirely consumed. There would be nothing left except the Lord left a remnant unto us. We would have become as Sodom and Gomorrah. Beloved, I want us to understand. We asked the question, how and why did the locusts come? Do we remember this? And we saw that in the same way the locusts, in the plagues of Egypt came as a result of Pharaoh's stubborn rejection of God's message to let his children go. In the same way, beloved, the stubbornness and the insubordination of this movement and its leadership in the year 1888, when we rejected God's message, which would have allowed us, according to Joel chapter 2, to let his son go forth of the most holy place, because of that, beloved, the locust came and the deterioration has happened in this body, in this movement, over the course of four generations. In Joel chapter 2, we found our answer as to who we are, what the Bible says our work is to be. Beginning at verse 23, the Bible says, Be glad then, beloved, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain, beloved, in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to who? To you. Now, beloved, when the Bible says that God will restore to you, can you see that he's speaking to somebody specifically? He did not say, I will restore, full stop. He specified who he was talking to in that he said he would do so to you. Now, how do we know that he's talking about this generation? Follow on in the text. He said, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. Beloved, are those not the first four generations of the movement? Yes, they are. God says, I will restore to you. Who is the you that God is referring to? He is referring to the generation that comes after the locust, after the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, the first, second, third, and fourth generations of this movement, which began in 1844 and concluded finally in the year 2004. So from 2004 on to 2044, God is speaking to that window, that generation. He says, unto you I will restore that which these generations have destroyed, my great army which I sent among you. Beloved, we are living in the generation of restoration, the generation that is to build up the old waste places, the restorers of paths to dwell in. That is who we are. 
When did Peter say Jesus would, would come back? Peter said in Acts chapter 3 that Jesus would be received into heaven and heaven would keep him until the times of the restitution or the restoration of all things. This generation, beloved, Matthew 24, verse 34, shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. I pray that it's becoming more and more clear to you. We have further to go, beloved. The restoration of all things in this generation can only happen in the same way we received all of those good gifts, all of those wonderful truths, present truth in the first generation. How did God do it in the first generation, beloved? He did it through an introduction to himself. Do you remember we saw in the book of Exodus, chapter 25? Turn there with me. We're going in our Bible to the book of Exodus, chapter 25. I want us to see that in the first generation, God did something specific to give us the truths upon which the movement was built. In the final generation, this final generation, God has to do the exact same thing all over again. Exodus 25, beginning at verse uh, 8. The Bible says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof even so shall ye make it verse 21 and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee verse 22 speaking of the mercy seat and there I will do what? Meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. All things that God has given unto this movement, whether it be health reform or dress reform, any of those reforms, beloved, they all came as a result of us being introduced to that man at the mercy seat. His name is Christ, our righteousness. In this final generation, beloved, though we have slipped so much and lost view of so much, God says he is going to restore unto us all that was lost in this generation. How is he going to do it? If he gave it to us by introducing himself, he must give it back by revealing himself to those of us who have lost sight of Christ at this time. Are you seeing my point? So the final generation is the generation of restoration in which we find ourselves, which began in the year 2004 and shall end in the year 2044, 40 years. But beloved, we know that God is going to cut the work short in righteousness. I do not believe that we're going to be here in the year 2044. Now that's my personal conviction based on the evidences that I have seen. I believe that God is going to wrap this thing up even shorter and quicker than that. He just needs a body that are willing to cooperate with him at this time. And he's going to do so through a revelation of himself. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 58 verses 12 and 14 that we are the restorers of paths to dwell in. We are to repair the breach that was made in the law of God. We are told in the book Christ's Object Lessons on page 415 in paragraph 5, Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. Notice, beloved, if we are the last generation, would we not be giving the last message of mercy? Yes. And if we are the last generation, are we not the generation of restoration? Yes, according to Joel. Then we are to restore through a revelation of God's character of love. Do you see that? The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Now, I want us to begin ascertaining the cause in order to restore God's image at this time. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, beginning at verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. What is the whole duty of man, beloved? Fear God 
and keep his commandments. That is what it means to be made in the image of God. You see, God's law, inspiration tells us, is a transcript of his character. And if we were made in the image of God, if we were made to demonstrate his character, then it makes sense that the law which testifies of his life should be the law which testifies of our lives as well. This is the whole duty of man. Now the question is, what deformed this image in man? If we're going to restore the image of God on time, we need to understand what needs to be taken away, that which deformed his image in man. Romans 3, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. Beloved, we're trying to move a little bit quickly because we're already, uh, we're already quite far into the, the time that we have together. But by the grace of God, we want to uh, close out this message on a high note. We want to understand the message for this generation. Amen. Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 23, the Bible says, for all have sinned, what have we done, beloved? Sinned and come short of the glory or of the character or of the image of God. Beloved, is it possible to reveal the glory of God, the character of God? Is it possible to reveal his image and yet have sin in our lives? No, it is not. Because sin, according to the Bible, comes short of that destiny. Sin comes short of the whole duty of man. In other words, it is sin that deforms God's image in us. And if God, through the plan of redemption, is to restore his image in man, then the plan of redemption has to have provided for the taking away of that which deforms God's image in us. Do we see the point? Very clear. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 that almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. Beloved, that word remission means to take away sin. The Bible says, unless there is blood, there is no taking away of sin. Remember, it is not in God's character to clear the guilty. And thus, the plan of redemption is not some means whereby God clears the guilty. No, beloved, the plan of redemption is the means by which God takes away the guilt, okay, and makes us entirely new in Christ, our righteousness. God does not clear the guilty. The cross was not some means by which the guilty escaped. The Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Thus Christ became us and we are able to say with the Apostle Paul, I am crucified, not I escaped. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ, my righteousness, liveth in me. Are we understanding? On our screen, beloved, I want us to see that it takes a dying lamb to supply that blood which allows the remission of sin. In the book of John chapter 1 and verse 29, the Bible speaks of Christ as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The Bible speaks of him in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7 in the same exact language. Who is the dying Lamb? It is Christ our righteousness. Amen? But beloved, do you know that in God's plan, a dying Lamb is not enough? You see, a dying Lamb can supply the blood, but follow on the screen, it takes a living priest to apply the merits of that blood. Do we see what I'm saying? While as a dying lamb, Christ supplied the blood, as a priest, beloved, he doesn't die. The Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So it takes a living priest to apply that blood. Hebrews chapter 8, turn there with me. We are considering the man, Christ our righteousness, in the context of the plan of redemption in the context of how God plans to restore his image in this final generation. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, speaking of Christ, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty located where, beloved? In the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary. So is there a sanctuary located in heaven where Christ our high priest is a minister? Yes, beloved. He is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. 
So we see that Christ is in fact the dying lamb that supplies the blood. Christ is in fact, after his resurrection, ascended to be the living priest, which applies the merits of that blood. And most Christians today stop at a dying lamb. And even when we talk about the resurrection, in many cases in Christianity today, we talk about the resurrection, Jesus has gone to heaven, and it seems as though Christ is in heaven twiddling his thumbs and just waiting, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, whenever they're ready, here I go, and then he will return. No, beloved, there is literally a plan in place. Until the living priest, Jesus Christ, has accomplished his work in the sanctuary above, according to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, we're going to be here until a harvest-ready people has been produced. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12, the Bible says, Neither by the blood of goats, catch this, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Jesus entered into the holy place by his own blood. Now the Bible says that flesh and blood will never inherit the kingdom of, 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 uh, of God. So it's not the literal blood that he took. In the book of Leviticus, the Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. In other words, by the merits of his life, which his blood shed testified of, beloved, Christ entered once into the holy place above. He entered into the sanctuary, beloved, for what purpose? Having obtained eternal redemption for us. So Jesus has entered into the sanctuary above, having obtained our eternal redemption. It's already there. It's already a fact, okay? And the purpose of the priest's work, the purpose of his office now in the most holy place is to apply that redemption, to make effectual that redemption in our specific cases, those of us who believe and receive the mediation that he's working there. Leviticus chapter 4 and Leviticus chapter 14 and verse 25 further this point by showing the work of the priest in applying the blood that is supplied by the lamb. Beloved, we need both a dying lamb and a living priest in order to restore in man the image of God. The final generation demonstrate the efficiency of that blood in that, as David said in Psalms chapter 102, uh, let's turn there one more time. The final generation demonstrate the efficiency of the blood that was supplied by the dying lamb. The final generation demonstrate the efficiency of that blood, which is applied by the living priest in that Psalms 102, beginning at verse 18. This shall be written for the generation to come and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord for he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. So while the Lord is beholding the earth from his work in the sanctuary above, there would come a generation, a final generation that would demonstrate the efficiency of the blood that got Jesus to work in that office. Because remember, he entered in by his own blood, by the merits of his life, that is how he entered into that office. There was no work of a priest, except first there be the blood supplied by the dying lamb. Now I wanna revisit a point that I made earlier concerning uh, victory over sin. Remember, the Bible says, nay, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. There is more than victory over sin for the final generation. In other words, beloved, the final generation has to be concerned with something more than merely their own victory over sin, more with merely their own overcoming, more than merely their own salvation. Beloved, if it is our salvation, our victory, our translation that we are focused on, we are still self-centered. And remember, sin originated in self-seeking. We need a motive by the grace of God that is higher than our own need for salvation, higher than our own need for victory over sin. I want us to understand, beloved, that if we stop at victory over sin, we will never finish the work. Follow the thought. Fallen men could not have a home in the paradise of God without the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Shall we not then exalt the cross of Christ? Angelic perfection did what, beloved? Failed in heaven. 
human perfection, beloved, did what? Failed in Eden, the paradise of bliss. All who wish for security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. Beloved, in other words, when the test came to the angels in heaven and a third of them fell, did they fail the test? Yes, they did. But weren't they sinless? Yes. When the test came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, did they fall too? Yes, they did. But weren't they also sinless at that time? Yes, they were. So then, beloved, preparing a people to stand at the test implies a lot more than merely getting the victory over sin. It implies more than merely reaching that perfect state of sinlessness. Remember, angelic perfection failed. Human perfection failed. And if all we have at the passing of a National Sunday Law is this motive for human perfection again, we're going to do what? Fail. There is a motive that is higher than our own victory that secures us in our victory that I need us to see. There is a motive that is more than sinlessness that we need in order to finish the work. What am I talking about? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68 in paragraph 2, we are told, But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. Beloved, if all we are concerned with is our salvation from sin, our victory over sin, then we don't yet understand the broader and deeper purpose of the plan. It says, it was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded. But it was to vindicate the character of God. It was to do what, beloved? To vindicate the character of God before the universe. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. Beloved, there's a lot that is written right there. I want us to take a moment and grasp everything we can from this quotation. There is a broader and deeper purpose to the plan of redemption than the salvation of men and our victory over sin. That broader and deeper purpose is the vindication of the character of God before all of the universe. You see, before the accuser of our brethren accused any man, he accused God of having certain characteristics, beloved. That Christ came into this world, according to inspiration, to reveal and to undo that deception that Satan had done. The final generation, in order to restore and to finish the work, to restore the image of God in man, must have an accurate picture of what God looks like, of what his character looks like, as revealed through the life of his son, Jesus Christ. We are to justify God, beloved, and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan and to reveal the nature and the results of sin. Now, beloved, many of us may think we understand what this quotation means, but let me tell you something, beloved. It's going to take some study. It's going to take some digging to really unearth all of the weight of this statement. All right? And we're living in the generation where such study is necessary because if we're to restore all things, if we're to be restored in the image of God in such a way that his character shines forth and Jesus can return at long last for a harvest, a harvest ripened body, we must know the weight of this statement. And we have to get our work done on time. What do you say? In the book of 1 John chapter 3, I want you to see something. Concerning victory over sin, beloved, do we need it in this final generation? Yes, we do. Can we do it by ourselves? No, we must cooperate with our faithful high priest. Amen? Leviticus 16. But I want us to see, beloved, in connection with that, that there is something that God wants to give to humanity to ensure and to enforce that victory. If we have this thing that God is seeking to give us, beloved, in our sinlessness by his grace, we will never fall. No matter how many times Satan shows up to press our buttons, the buttons simply will fail to work. There is one thing that we need. I'm going to prove it to you. First John chapter 3. 
beginning in verse 4. The Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he, that is Christ, was manifested to take away our sin. Amen? And in him is no sin. Verse 6, crucial, beloved. Whosoever abideth in Christ sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen Christ, neither what? Known Christ. Do you see that, beloved? If we are continuing in sin, it is an evidence that we have not seen him and we have not known him. Now, if that is the case, then according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 6, beloved, the, 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 the remedy that is necessary in the final generation to take sin away is a revelation of Christ, is a knowledge of God as presented in Christ. We need to know God. If we're continuing in sin, according to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 6, it is an evidence, beloved, that we have not seen God and we certainly don't know God. The Bible says that we must know Him, okay? Inspiration says that to know Him is to love Him. And Jesus said, if you loved me, you would keep my commandments. So at the heart, the very core of this victory over sin issue is the knowledge of God, beloved. What do you know about Him? Do we actually know him as it is our privilege to know him? Have we studied his attributes, his character? Or do we still believe the lies that Satan has told about our God of love? Beloved, it, it, we're living in the generation where we actually have to understand these things. In the great controversy, we're told that in order to stand true to God, we have to have a right knowledge of his government, of his purposes, and act in accordance with it. We have to know the God we serve. We have to understand his character as revealed in the man Christ Jesus. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 through 21. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, beloved. Be ye what? reconciled to God. Beloved, being reconciled to God is a matter of understanding who God is. Remember, in the book of Genesis chapter 3, when Satan was seeking to get Eve and Adam to get into sin, he first had to lie about the character of God. When we receive that lie about God, we next committed sin, which separated us from Jesus. So reconciliation and restoration in this final generation and the removal of sin completely infinitely hinge, vitally hinge on the understanding we have of God's character. If we still believe the lies of the serpent, we will continue in the behavior of the rebellious. But when we reveal the character of God as seen in the life of his son, Jesus Christ, as seen by the man that is seated on the mercy seat right now, beloved, we will find ourselves reflecting that image because by beholding him, we will at last be changed into his marvelous character. Be reconciled to God. For he hath made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin. Why, beloved? That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Beloved, I want you to see that it is not merely victory over sin that is the burden of this text. The text does not say that God made Christ to be sin for us so that we could be made righteous. That's not what the text says. Please catch what I am saying right now. It is vital to finishing the work. Okay? The text says that Christ was made to be sin for us, not that we might be righteous, which is certainly what's going to happen by God's grace, but that we might be made the righteousness of God. Do you see that? God doesn't merely want us to be focused, beloved, on becoming right doers. He wants us to become the evidence of his right doing. It is not about us, beloved. This self-centered view of the great controversy has to change. And the only way it can change is if we turn our eyes upon Jesus at this time. God is not merely looking for right doers. He is looking for us to become the evidence of his right doing. Amen? 
God is not merely seeking to prove that Satan is wrong in this great controversy. He is seeking to prove that Satan and every sinner there ever was, you were never wronged by God. It is his character that is on trial here. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6 and verse 7. In verse 7, the Bible says that the hour of his judgment is come. Beloved, yes, it is true that our characters are in review at the judgment seat, but I want us to understand the, first of all, God knows all things. He remembers our frame. He knows that we are but dust. He's aware of our backslidings and our weaknesses. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Okay? There is nothing that we can present to God in the judgment about our character that he does not already infinitely know. So then the context, when we're talking about the investigation of the judgment, beloved, it's not you and I merely that are the focus, but it is you and I in the context of what do our lives say about that man? What do our lives say about God and of Christ his son? What do we say? What do we demonstrate by our lives is the truth concerning God's character. The hour of his judgment is come. And the only reason why we are even considered in the judgment, the only reason why our characters are in review is because the man Christ Jesus has so intimately united us to himself, beloved, that it is impossible to look at Jesus except you look at us. It is impossible to look at us who believe on him except you look at him. Because he lives, we must live also. Let me prove this to you. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. One of my favorite uh, texts in the Bible. Colossians chapter 3 tells us, beginning in verse uh, 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Your life is hid where? With Christ in God. So in order for anyone to review the life of Brother Paul, do you understand you have to review it with Christ in God because that is where my life is hid. In order for anyone to review or to accuse your life, they have to consider your life with Christ in God. That is precisely where it is. As a matter of fact, the Bible takes it even deeper in verse 4 where the Bible says, When Christ, who is our life. What does the Bible call Christ, beloved? Christ is our life. And so again, the central theme of the investigative judgment is the life of God. But Christ has so intimately united himself with us, beloved, that it is impossible to talk about our lives without talking about the man. It is impossible to talk about the character of God without looking into our lives to see whether or not these things are so. We were made in the image of God. And in the final gest generation, we are restored in the express image of God. Christ our righteousness. Beloved, I pray that none of these points are going over your head. And if they are, I pray that you rewind and that you play again until this thing sinks in deeply. Repetition deepens the impression, beloved, and I want you to be deeply impressed with what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. I want us to understand this text here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20 shows us that in order to finish the work, it's not merely a... Uh, 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 we should not merely be concerned with our getting the victory. We should be concerned with the fact that our victory testifies to the goodness of God. That's why we want victory over sin, beloved. That is why the ministers of God consistently press upon us to become close, intimate friends of that man. Because if you closely, intimately, personally know Jesus, beloved, then the sinlessness that is produced from that is reinforced by that relationship. Why is it that Joseph refused to sleep with Potiphar's wife? He said, how could I do this wicked thing against my God? Beloved, it is the love of God that secures us in our sinlessness. It is not our sinlessness alone that keeps us from falling, but our love for Jesus. Do you see the point? Do you see the point? I pray that you catch it. God is not merely looking for right doers, beloved. He is looking for evidence of his right doing. In fact, the Bible says that there are those of us who we, we, we look at the righteousness of God 
and we go about trying to establish our own righteousness, our own victory, not submitting ourselves to the righteousness of God. God wants our submission, our cooperation at this time. He's not looking for us to do right. In fact, the only right thing we can do is surrender. He is looking for us to become the evidence of his right doing. If we yield our members, the Bible says, to God as instruments of righteousness, God will never fail to perform concerning you what he declared ought to be done. That is what the Bible says. Now, beloved, we're coming to a close, but I want us to recognize the message that restores. I want us to recognize what? the message that restores. We're told in testimonies to ministers and gospel workers on page 91 in paragraph two, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world, the uplifted savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in victory over sin. Obedience to all the commandments of God. Do you see that? This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, beloved, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Now we've read this quotation, we've dissected this quotation time and time again. If you want more on this quotation, beloved, I invite you to go back and watch the beginning of this series. I invite you to go back and watch also the Gathering the Fragments series that we did on this channel in the year 2020. But what we get from this quotation, beloved, is that justification by faith, as presented in the 1888 message, is the latter rain message. It is the loud cry message of the third angel. Do we see that? All right, moving forward. In the Ellen G. White 1888 materials, on page 765, we're told, the end is near. We have not a moment to lose. Light is to shine forth from God's people, how? in clear, distinct rays, bringing Jesus before number one, the churches, and number two, the world. So you see, the message is to go to all people, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, but it goes in a particular order. Wasn't that the same, beloved, in the book of Acts? In, on the day of uh, 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 Pentecost, did God not say that they were, to lay, they were to wait in Jerusalem and that they would become his witnesses in all of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the world? He gave it in a specific order. Amen? It says one interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other subject. What subject is that? Christ our righteousness. This is life eternal. Catch this part, beloved, because many miss it. This is life eternal, that they may do what? Know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Beloved, I want us to see that the latter rain message is Christ our righteousness, revealing the knowledge of the character of God. The latter rain message is Christ our righteousness revealing the knowledge of the character of God. Why do I make that emphasis? Because beloved, today there are many who say that they understand the 1888 message, but their understanding of God's righteousness of his character is so far from what Christ demonstrated. And I'm not merely talking about lip speaking, beloved. I'm talking about the lives that we live. When you look at a man who claims to know the message of 1888 of justification by faith, who claims to understand the righteousness of Christ, you can always tell if he understands the character of God as presented in that message through the way he interacts with his brethren, through the way that he interacts with those who would even call themselves his enemies. Beloved, we have to become like Jesus. And God has not left us to do this work in some impossible, uh, arduous task. No, beloved, he has made it possible in that he has revealed himself through his son. All we need to do by the grace of God is look and live. By beholding Christ aright, we will become changed. The latter rain message is Christ our righteousness, revealing the knowledge of the character of God.
Now, I want to give you some biblical evidences for this as we close. Biblical evidence, Hosea chapter 6. Biblical evidence for this fact. We are going to the book of Hosea chapter 6. What are we proving from the Bible? We are proving that the final message of Christ our righteousness, the latter rain message, beloved, is a revelation of the knowledge of God's character. The Bible uh, is going to show us this right now, but we saw an inspiration that one subject uh, would swallow up every other subject, one interest would prevail, that is Christ our righteousness, and the very next words out of the prophet's mouth was quoting John 17 verse 3, where it said, This is life eternal, that they may know thee. You can't know God except you understand the message of Christ's righteousness. That righteousness reveals it. Hosea chapter 6, the Bible says, beginning in verse 1, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. I will leave a link to the video in which this text was uh, highlighted, the final call and the final generation. Verse 3 says, Then shall we know if, what is that word, beloved? If, meaning it is conditional. Then shall we know if we follow on to do what? Know the Lord, that his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. The Bible says in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 3 that if we follow on to know the Lord, if we understand who he is, his character, then, beloved, shall we know that his going forth, his coming back out of the most holy place, Joel chapter 2, his going forth is prepared as the morning and he will come unto us as the early and the latter rain. So why is it, beloved? that some of us with this knowledge of 1888's history have yet to receive in our personal experience that latter rain power. That latter rain power, beloved, that would give us victory over every sin. That early rain power that would give us victory over every sin. Why haven't we experienced it? It is because we have yet to follow on to know the Lord. We have the history of the message, beloved, but we, ch we choose to take the message of righteousness according to our own understanding of what righteousness is. Um, let, me not, let me not even say that. You see, I, I, I took the words out of the reformer's mouth. I will allow A.T. Jones to lay it plain and bare as we close right here. A.T. Jones, in the General Conference Daily Bulletin of 1893, on pages 243, paragraphs 10 and 12, said these words. Now that message of the righteousness of Christ is the loud cry. It is the latter rain. We have been praying for the latter rain here at this conference already, haven't we? Well, what were you looking for when your prayer was answered? Beloved, do we know what to expect when we're asking for the latter rain? A.T. Jones says it should be this message of the righteousness of Christ. Are you ready now to receive the latter rain? That is, are you ready to receive, what is that, beloved? God's message of righteousness according to righteousness. Notice the reformer did not say, are we ready to receive God's message of righteousness? And that's it. He said, are we ready to receive God's message of righteousness according to righteousness? Let us look at that a little further. Joel says, according to the margin, that it is a teacher of righteousness, that which brings the teaching of righteousness according to righteousness. Now notice what A.T. Jones says next. Whose idea of righteousness? The congregation said God's idea of righteousness. Jones says, if I receive the righteousness of Christ, let me say it another way. If I receive the 1888 message, According to my idea, is not that enough? Is not that receiving the latter rain? Is not that receiving the righteousness of Christ? The congregation said, no, sir, that is your own righteousness. And Jones comments by saying, but that is what is the matter with a good many people who have heard this message of the righteousness of Christ. They have received the message of the righteousness of Christ according to their own idea of what his righteousness or his character, excuse me, is. 
and they have not the righteousness of Christ at all. According to Jones, beloved, what is it that is hindering God's movement from receiving the righteousness of Christ? For many of us, he says, it is the fact that we receive the message of Christ's righteousness, but according to our own idea of what righteousness, our own idea of what God's character looks like. Do you see it? And we can never receive it that way. In fact, Jones continues by saying, but let us dwell further upon that thought. And I am in no hurry to get away from it either. Neither are we here at Clear Distinction Ministries, beloved. We're going to press this point until we understand. Because we've been talking about 1888 for a very, very long time. Talking about the righteousness of Christ for a very, very long time. Talking about that teacher of righteousness according to our own ideas of what righteousness ought to look like. And the experience of God's people testifies that what I'm saying is actually so. When we receive the teaching, that teaching of righteousness, according to righteousness, we must receive it according to what? God's idea of righteousness and not according to our own measure of it. In other words, beloved, the only right way to receive the message that came in 1888 is according to God's idea of what righteousness, of what his character looks like. Now my question is, where exactly do we get God's idea of what righteousness looks like? God's idea of what his character looks like? Inspiration says that we have only one perfect photograph, okay, of the character of God. And that is Jesus, Christ. This is why the uplifted Savior was to first be presented to the church and then to the world. Because if we would understand that message of righteousness according to the character demonstrated in the life of Jesus, beloved, we would get the picture correct. And with the correct picture, we could, just as God has done, draw the entire world unto himself through the loving kindness that we would demonstrate. We have to know the character of God. There's no other way to receive this message. Are we understanding what I'm saying here? Are we understanding what A.T. Jones is saying here? And he who thinks of receiving that message of Christ's righteousness according to his own idea of it will miss it entirely. I wonder how many of us actually have the 1888 message today. We are to receive it according to God's idea of it and nothing else than God's idea of righteousness. Nothing else than that is righteousness. Beloved, we're going to close here with one text. I know that I've talked to you about a lot today. We've gone through a lot. We've actually gone over the time. We, we've talked about a lot. What I want us to understand at the close of this message, beloved, is that yes, the message of Jones and Wagner is the message designed by God to finish the work. But according to Jones and according to the Bible, and according to inspiration, generally speaking, beloved, it is impossible to receive the message that Jones and Wagner brought correctly, except we do so through God's idea of righteousness. It's not just a teacher of righteousness, beloved, and that's it. It's a teacher of righteousness according to God's understanding of what righteousness, according to God's understanding of what his character really is. First John chapter five is the text that we're going to close on. I don't want you to, 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 to leave this place feeling that, you know, oh man, do I really understand the 1888 message? Beloved, if we're looking in that direction, at the very least, by God's grace, we're looking in the right place. There is no way that the Holy Spirit, inspiration says that if we are looking unto Christ, the Holy Spirit never ceases his work until we are perfectly conformed in his image. Continue to look into that message. Continue to look towards that man. But beloved, as we're looking at that man, let us allow the life that he demonstrates to dictate what the character of God looks like for us. So that as we are reaching out for righteousness, it is actually His righteousness, His life, His character that we are receiving. Are we understanding the point? 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20 gives us hope at the conclusion of our study. It says, And we know that the Son of God is come and has given us an understanding, beloved, that we may know Him. That is true. And we are in him that is true, even his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Bringing us full circle back to John 17 and verse 3, where the Bible said, Jesus said, And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, 
the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Beloved, Jesus is come, and he has given us an understanding that we may know God and receive that message of righteousness according to righteousness, so that the latter rain experience can be yours and mine, and we can finish the work of restoration in this final generation. Beloved, I pray that this study has been a blessing to your soul. It has blessed me tremendously. I see that my family and I have to come up much higher. I see that my views of God have to become deeper. And, and, and my, my gaze on God, as a matter of fact, looking at him, has to become much more deep, much more longer. I have to look at this man and consider this man and study this man until this man, Christ Jesus, is all that I see. And if we're honest with ourselves, beloved, in this final generation, we have been educated to look to man and to expect help from man, but we have not been looking to the author and the finisher of our faith. This is the purpose of that most precious message, to reveal the righteousness of Christ according to righteousness. Beloved, join us in our next study. We're going to pick up from right here where we left off, and we're going to... We're going to, we're going to um, Hew out this thought even further. We're going to dig deeper. We're going we're gonna to spend time building on it because we need to see that in order to restore the image of God, a revelation of his character of love as seen in Jesus is essential at this time. God bless you. Maranatha from our family at Clear Distinction Ministries.